Lord of the Flies, Chapter 5, Part 1. The tide was coming in and there was only a narrow strip of firm beach between the water and the white, stumbling stuff near the palm terrace. Ralph chose the firm strip as a path because he needed to think, and only here could he allow his feet to move without having to watch them. Suddenly, pacing by the water, he was overcome with astonishment. He found himself understanding the wearisomeness of this life, where every path was an improvisation and a considerable part of one's waking life was spent watching one's feet. He stopped facing the strip and remembering that first enthusiastic exploration as though it was a part of a brighter childhood, he smiled jeeringly. He turned then and walked back towards the platform with the sun in his face. The time had come for the assembly and as he walked into the concealing splendours of the sunlight, he went carefully over the points of his speech. There must be no mistake about this assembly, no chasing imaginary. He lost himself in a maze of thoughts that were rendered vague by his lack of words to express them. Frowning, he tried again. This meeting must not be fun, but business. At that he walked faster, aware all at once of urgency and the declining sun and a little wind created by his speed that breathed about his face. The wind pressed his grey shirt against his chest so that he noticed in this new mood of comprehension, how the folds were stiff like cardboard and unpleasant. Notice too how the frayed edges of his shorts were making an uncomfortable pink area at the front of his thighs. With a convulsion of the mind, Ralph discovered dirt and decay, understood how much he disliked perpetually flicking the tangled hair out of his eyes, and at last, when the sun was gone, rolling noisily to rest among dry leaves, and at that he began to trot. The beach near the bathing pool was dotted with groups of boys waiting for the assembly. They made way for him silently, conscious of his grim mood and the fault at the fire. The place of assembly in which he stood was roughly a triangle, but irregular and sketchy like everything they made. First, there was the log on which he himself sat, a dead tree that must have been quite exceptionally big for the platform. Perhaps one of those legendary storms of the Pacific had shifted it here. The palm trunk lay parallel to the beach so that when Ralph sat he faced the island, but to the boys was a darkish figure against the shimmer of the lagoon. The two sides of the triangle of which the log was based were less evenly defined. On the right was a log polished by restless seats along the top, but not so large as the chiefs and not so comfortable. On the left were four small logs, one of them, the farthest, lamentingly springy. Assembly after assembly had broken up in laughter when someone had leaned too far back and the log had whipped and thrown half a dozen boys backwards into the grass. Yet now, he saw, no one had had the wit, not himself, nor Jack, nor Piggy, to bring a stone and wedge the thing. So they were continuing enduring the ill-balanced twister, because, because, again, he lost himself in deep waters. Grass was worn away in front of each trunk but grew tall and untrodden in the centre of the triangle. Then at the apex, the grass was thick again because no one sat there. All round the place of assembly, the grey trunks rose, straight or leaning, and supported the low roof of leaves. On two sides was the beach, behind the lagoon, in front the darkness of the island. Ralph turned to the chief sea. They had never had an assembly as late before. That was why the place looked so different. Normally, the underside of the green roof was lit by a tangle of golden reflections, and their faces were lit upside down, like, thought Ralph, when you hold an electric torch in your hands, but now the sun was slanting in at one side so that the shadows were where they ought to be. Again he fell into a strange mood of speculation that was so foreign to him. If faces were different when lit from above or below, what was a face? What was anything? Ralph moved impatiently. The trouble was, if you were a chief you had to think, you had to be wise, and then the occasion slipped by so that you had to grab at a decision. This made you think, because thought was a valuable thing that got results. I only decided Ralph as he faced the chief seat. I can't think, not like Piggy. Once more that evening, Ralph had to adjust his values. Piggy could think, he could go step by step inside that fat head of his, only Piggy was no chief. But Piggy, for his ludicrous body, had brains. Ralph was a specialist in thought now and could recognise thought in another. The sun in his eyes reminded him how time was passing. So he took the conch from the tree and examined the surface. Exposure to the air had bleached the yellow and pink to near white and transparency. Ralph felt a kind of affectionate reverence for the conch, even though he had fished the thing out of the lagoon itself. He, placed, he faced the place of assembly and put the conch to his lips. The others were waiting for this and came straight away. Those who were 
aware that a ship had passed on the island while the fire was out were subdued by the thought of Ralph's anger, while those, including the little ones who did not know, were impressed by the general air of solemnity. The place of assembly filled quickly. Jack, Simon, Maurice, most of the hunters on Ralph's right, the rest on the left under the sun. Piggy came and stood outside the triangle. This indicated that he wished to listen but would not speak, and Piggy intended this as a gesture of disapproval. The thing is, we need an assembly. No one said anything, but the faces turned to Ralph were intent. He flourished a conch. He had learned as a practical business that fundamental statements like this had to be said at least twice before everyone understood them. One had to sit, attracting all eyes to the conch, and drop words like heavy round stones among the little groups that crouched or squatted. He was searching his mind for simple words so that even the little ones would understand what the assembly was about. Later, perhaps, practice debaters, Jack, Maurice, Piggy, would use their whole art to twist the meeting, but now at the beginning, the subject of the debate must be laid out clearly. We need an assembly, not for fun, not for laughing or falling off the log, the group of little ones on the twister giggled and looked at each other, not for making jokes or for, he lifted the conch in an effort to find a compelling word, for cleverness, not for those things, but to put things straight. He paused for a moment. I've been alone. By myself, I went thinking that's what. I know what we need an assembly to put things straight. And first of all, I'm speaking. He paused for a moment and automatically pushed back his hair. Piggy tiptoed to the triangle, his ineffectual protest made and joined the others. Ralph went on. We have lots of assemblies. Everybody enjoys speaking and being together. We decide things, but we don't. they don't get done. We were going to have water brought from the stream and left in those coconut shells under dry leaves. So it was for a few days. Now there's no water. The shells are dry. People must drink from the river. There was a murmur of assent. Not that there's anything wrong with drinking from the river. I mean, I'd sooner have water from that place, you know, the pool where the waterfall is, than out of an old coconut shell. Only we said we'd have the water bought, and now not. There were only two full shells there this afternoon. He licked his lips. Then there's huts, shelters. The murmur swelled again and died away. You mostly sleep in shelters. Tonight, except for summer it's set up by the fire, you'll all sleep there. Who built the shelters? Karma rose at once. Everyone had built the shelters. Ralph had to wave the conch once more. Wait a minute. I mean, who built all three? We all built the first one, four of us the second, and me and Simon built the last one over there. That's why it's so tottery. No, don't laugh. That shelter might fall down if the rain comes back. We need those shelters then. He paused and cleared his throat. There's another thing. We chose those rocks right beyond the bathing pool as a lavatory. That was sensible too. The tide cleans the place up. You litlands know about that. There were sniggers here and there and swift glances. Now people seem to use anywhere, even near the shelters and the platform. You little ones, when you're getting fruit, if you're taken short, the assembly roared. I said, if you're taken short, you keep away from the fruit. That's dirty. Laughter rose again. I said, that's dirty. He plucked at his stiff grey shirt. That's really dirty. If you're taken short, you go right along the beach to the rocks, see? Piggy held out his hands for the conch, but Ralph shook his head. The speech was planned point by point. We've all got to use the rocks again. This place is getting dirty. He paused. The assembly, sensing a crisis, was tensely expectant. And then, about the fire. Ralph let out his spare breath with a little gasp that was echoed by his audience. Jack started to chip away a piece of wood with his knife and whispered something to Robert, who looked away. The fire is the most important thing on the island. How can we ever be excused except by luck if we don't keep a fire going? Is a fire too much for us to make? He flung out an arm. Look at us. How many are we? And yet we can't keep a fire going to make smoke. Don't you understand? Can't you see we ought to ought to die before we let the fire out? There was a self-conscious giggling among the hunters. Ralph turned to them passionately. You hunters, you can laugh. But I tell you the smoke is more important than the pig, however often you kill one. Do all of you see? He spread his arms wide and turned to the whole triangle. We've got to make smoke up there or die. He paused, feeling for his next point. And another thing. Someone called out. Too many things. There came a mutter of agreement. Ralph overrode them. And another thing, we nearly set the whole island on fire and we waste time rolling rocks and making little cooking fires. Now I say this and make it a rule because I'm chief. We won't have a fire anywhere but here, anywhere but on the mountain, ever. There was a row immediately. Boys stood up and shouted and Ralph shouted back. Because if you want a fire to cook fish or crab, you can jolly well go up the mountain. That way we'll be certain. Hands were reaching for the conch in the light of the setting sun. He held on and leapt on the trunk. All this I meant to say, now I've said it. You've voted me for chief, now you do what I say. They quieted slowly and at last were seated again. 
Ralph dropped down and spoke in his ordinary voice. So remember, the rocks were a lavatory to keep the fire going and smoke showing as a signal. Don't take fire from the mountain, take your food up there. Jack stood up, scowling in the gloom and held out his hands. I haven't finished yet. But you've talked and talked, I've got the conch. Jack sat down grumbly. Then the last thing, this is what people can talk about. He waited till the platform was very still. Things are breaking up, I don't understand why. We began well, we were happy, and then, he moved the conch gently, looking beyond them at nothing, remembering the beastie, the snake, the fire, the talk of fear. Then people started getting frightened. A murmur, almost a moan, rose and passed away. Jack had stopped whittling. Ralph went on abruptly. But that's Littlem's talk. We'll get that straight. So the last part, the bit we can all talk about, is kind of deciding on the fear. The hair was creeping into his eyes again. We've got to talk about this fear and decide there's nothing in it. I'm frightened myself sometimes, only that's nonsense, like babies. Then, when we've decided, we can start again and be careful about things like the fire. A picture of three boys walking along the bright beach flitted through his mind, and be happy. Ceremon uh, ceremonially, Ralph laid the conch on the trunk beside him as a sign that the speech was over. What sunlight reached them was level. Jack stood up and took the conch. So this is a meeting to find out what's what. I'll tell you what's what. You little and started all this with the fear talk. Beasts? Where from? Of course we're frightened sometimes, but we put up with being frightened. Only Ralph says you scream in the night. What does that mean but nightmares? Anyway, you don't hunt or build or help. You're a lot of crybabies and sissies, that's what. And as for the fear, you'll have to put up with that like the rest of us. Ralph looked at Jack open mouthed, but Jack took no notice. The thing is, fear can't hurt you any more than a dream. There aren't any beasts to be afraid of on this island. He looked along the row of whispering little ones. Said you right if something did get you, you useless sort of crybabies, because there is no animal. Ralph interrupted him testily. What is all this? Who said anything about an animal? You did the other day. You said they dream and cry, uh, dream and cry out. Now they talk, not only the little ones, but my hunters sometimes. Talk of a thing, a dark thing, a beast, some sort of animal I've heard. You thought not, didn't you? Now listen, you don't get big animals in small islands, only pigs. You only get lions and tigers in big countries like Africa and India and the zoo. I've got the conch. I'm not talking about the fear. I'm talking about the beast. Be frightened if you like. But as for the beast, Jack paused, cradling the conch and turned to his hunters with their dirty black caps. Am I a hunter or am I not? They nodded simply. He was a hunter, all right. No one doubted that. Well then, I've been all over this island by myself. If there were a beast, I'd have seen it. Be frightened because you're like that. But there is no beast in the forest. Jack handed him the conch and sat down. The whole assembly applauded him with relief. Then Piggy held out his hand. I don't agree with all Jack said, but with some. Of course there isn't a beast in the forest. How could there be? What would a beast eat? Pig. We eat pig. Piggy. I've got the conch, said Piggy indignantly. Ralph. They ought to shut up, oughtn't they? You shut up, you little ones. What I mean is I don't agree about this here fear. Of course there isn't nothing to be afraid of in the forest. Why, I've been there myself. You'll be talking about ghosts and such things next. We know what goes on, and if there's something wrong, there's someone to put it right. He took off his glasses and blinked at them. The sun had gone as if the light had been turned off. He proceeded to explain. If you get a pain in your stomach, whether it's a little one or a big one, yours is a big one. When you're done laughing, perhaps we can get on with the meeting. And if them little ones climb back on the twister again, they'll only fall off in a sec, so they might as well sit on the ground and listen. No, you have doctors for everything, even the side of, even for the inside of your mind. You don't really mean that we got to be frightened all the time of nothing. Life, said Piggy expansively, is scientific, that's what it is. In a year or two, when the war's over, they'll be travelling to Mars and back. I know there isn't no beast, not with claws and all that, I mean. But I know there isn't no fear either. Piggy paused. Unless, Ralph mused restlessly. Unless what? Unless we get frightened of people. A sound half laugh, half jeer, rose among the seated boys. Piggy ducked his head and went on hastily. So let's hear from that little one who talked about a beast and perhaps we can show him how silly he is. The little ones began to jabber among themselves. Then one stood forward. What's your name? Phil. For a little one, he was self-confident, holding out his hands, cradling the conch as Ralph did, looking around at them to collect their attention before he spoke. Last night I had a dream, a horrid dream, fighting with things. I was outside the shelter by myself, fighting with things, these horrible twisty things in the trees. He paused and the other little ones laughed in a horrified sympathy. Then I was frightened and I woke up. Then I was outside the shelter by myself in the dark and the twisty things had gone away. The vivid horror of this, so possible and so nakedly terrifying, held them all silent. The child's voice went piping on from behind the white conch. 
and I was frightened and started to call out for Ralph and then I saw something moving among the trees, something big and horrid. He paused, half frightened by the recollection, yet proud of the sensation he was creating. That was a nightmare, said Ralph. He was walking in his sleep. The assembly murmured in subdued agreement. The Lytton shook his head stubbornly. I was awake when the twisty things were fighting and they went away as I awake and I saw something big and horrid moving in the trees. Ralph held his hand out for the conch and the little one sat down. You were asleep. There wasn't anyone there. How could anyone be wandering in the forest at night? Was anyone? Did anyone go out? There was a long pause while the assembly grinned at the thought of someone going out in the darkness. Then Simon stood up and Ralph looked at him in astonishment. You? What were you mucking about in the dark for? Simon grabbed the conch convulsively. I wanted a place to go to a place I know. What place? Just a place I know. A place in the jungle, he hesitated.